Good morning. It is Sunday, August the 8th. And this morning, uh, just a heads up, we are going to be participating in communion at the end of the sermon. So if you want to make preparations for that, I'd suggest that uh, you do so at this time. You know, it's interesting when it comes to being a follower of Jesus Christ, there's, there's often a lot of emphasis placed on uh, correct beliefs and a correct appreciation of those beliefs, you know, the behaviors that flow from that. And while certainly Jesus did nothing uh, that would change that perspective, except to say that one of the things he emphasized a lot was attitude. When we look in this morning's passage, I believe that that's what we're going to see. So let's turn to the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to be picking it up from where we left off last week in chapter 1 and beginning at verse 9. So it says, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, He saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son with whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And at once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. I want to pick up and and it seems strange we're in the gospel of Mark, but I want to read from Matthew's account of Christ's baptism to see an additional piece that's important for us to understand. So we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 3. And as we pick this up, it starts off very similarly. It's Matthew chapter 3 and in beginning at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It's proper to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove, alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So one of the questions that is often asked about uh, the baptism passages is that if John's baptism was a baptism for the repentance of sins, meaning you would um, be baptized as a heart indication, as a life indication, that you wanted to turn away from sinful behaviors, And if that's the case, why did Jesus need to get baptized? Uh, It wasn't a case that that Jesus was repenting of any sins. He led a a sinless life. And that was the basis for his being um, the chosen sacrifice to offer himself for our sins on the cross. He didn't have any of his own sins that he was dying for. That made him the perfect sacrifice to be offered on behalf of everyone else. There's a lot of opinions about why Jesus got baptized. And some of them are very elaborate ex, uh, explanations that you know go into a lot of what I would consider to be speculative kinds of uh, lines of thinking. In my opinion, the simplest explanation is the best. I think that what is really going on here is that Jesus was wanting to demonstrate that he was introducing a new covenant. He would replace the Old Testament covenant of, you know, uh, having to follow the law, and then if you failed in that respect, you had to offer sacrifices for your sins, you know, an animal sacrifice of one form or another. And the reality is the Old Testament showed the futility of trying to earn a righteousness through our own good behavior. It showed that you needed to have a constant sense of attentiveness to your relationship between you and God so that you were um, on good terms with him and you had to constantly do the kinds of things that would earn you 
that relationship. Jesus was introducing a new covenant, a new covenant between God and humanity. And the forgiveness of sins came through himself, through his sacrifice on the cross. It was an introduction of righteousness that was not earned. It was received. It was a righteousness that really required humility on the part of the believer. It required an honest look at oneself without deflecting away to excuses or judging yourself by comparing yourself with someone else. Um, You know, Jesus uh, identified that when he talked about uh, the two kinds of people offering prayers in the temple. The one person talked about how good they were and how, you know, they gave... uh, alms to the poor, and they fasted and did all of these kinds of things. They weren't like that sinner over there. But Jesus commended that sinner when he said, you know, the sinner is there saying, you know, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinful man. Jesus wanted us to enter into a relationship with himself, with God, on the basis of humbly looking at ourselves and not comparing ourselves to somebody else so that we felt better about ourselves. This new covenant was rooted in humility and it was acknowledging our absolute dependency on God. And if Jesus was going to usher in this new kingdom where one of the keys is humility and not thinking of ourselves too highly then it was going to be one of the premises that this kingdom was based on, and Jesus needed to demonstrate that. How much more so than to submit to baptism when he didn't need to, but he did so in order to set the right example. Do you see? One of the the clear um, ways that you can point to humility is somebody being willing to take on a burden that they didn't have to bear or being willing to um, take a position that they were much higher or above. Jesus demonstrated that in, in just so many ways. He demonstrated, you know, when we look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 8, let's turn to that passage You see, in it, the Apostle Paul is talking about Christ and the example he set when he said this. He said, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, in other words, if if you feel good about that fact that you're in relationship with him, if you have any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, and then this is Paul speaking, he says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Stop thinking about yourself and rather in humility value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then here it is. What is this mindset? Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with, with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Paul is speaking to the Philippian church and he's saying, look it, if you want to follow in Christ's footsteps, then follow in the footsteps of Christ by identifying with his humility. Jesus didn't need to be baptized, but he chose to be baptized so that he could demonstrate a willingness to obey the Father in all things. D.A. Carson, in commentating on this passage, He said that Jesus knew that he was the suffering servant that was identified in Isaiah 52 and 53. The servant's first mark is obeying God. This is the message that 
that Jesus wanted to put first and foremost right at the heart of, um, of the beginning of his ministry. His ministry really had a starting line that was formed when he submitted to that baptism, a baptism that wasn't required for him except to do so as an example for us. That's powerful. And you know, it's interesting. In those passages that talk about Christ's baptism, it says that he was immediately led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And, you know, it it shouldn't surprise us at all that the basis of every temptation that he experienced was whether he would use his power of being very in very nature God to do or to choose something for himself. You know, turn these breads into stone. You've got to be hungry. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do you see? I'm not going to turn these stones into bread, even though I can, just to feed myself. Wow. You see, he's not going to use his power to pad his own nest, so to speak. The other temptations, you know, uh, appeal to God to protect you as you, what, jump off the temple and test whether God would do that for you as his son? Jesus said, I'm not going to put God to the test to, to prove his promises to me. I trust God. I don't need to have something done uh, to prove that to myself. Do you see? Again, humility. Pride is often described as, as having a fear for ourselves and a, and a desire to protect ourselves, so we puff ourselves up. Jesus in humility said, you know what? I know God's made his promise to me. I'm good. I don't need to test that. You know, and the final temptation is the most obvious. You know, uh, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world if you just bow down to me, Jesus. And, you know, amazing that Satan would try and tempt the ruler of all the heavens and the earth by offering him the mere kingdoms of the earth. It shows how short-sighted Satan was, but it also shows that Jesus, again, wasn't going to... um, provide those comforts that those earthly kingdoms could provide for him in his human form. You know, Jesus would later say in Luke that, you know, if you're going to follow me, then be aware. Um, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. Why? Because he was offered all the kingdoms of this world and he rejected it because he was building something far greater, the kingdom of God. And, you know, folks, there it is. His baptism speaks volumes to us because as his followers, we have to get off of thinking about ourselves. We have to get off that page. And, you know, when Jesus was ushering this in, this kingdom of God, You know, it's ironic that he would speak to the very thing that we need to have emphasized in our lives again and again and again. In James chapter 4, there is this passage that, I mean, to be honest, uh, James is not subtle. You know, he doesn't leave anything to the imagination. When God was inspiring him to write this, um, uh, James didn't hold anything back. The Spirit said it, so James just put it down there in black and white for us to take it in and to be honestly um, cuffed upside the head white. Listen to these words in James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives 
that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Ouch. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell within us? But he gives us more grace. And that's why the scripture says, and here it is, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, just as he did our Lord. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Jesus was ushering in a new kingdom. And if that new kingdom was not one where he would take upon himself all of the little perks, you know, indulge the preferences, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little peckish, so uh, those stones there, I'll just turn them into bread or something to eat so I can satisfy myself. I, I mean, it, you get the point. Jesus is looking at this kingdom and he wanted it first and foremost to be about God. It is God's kingdom. But when we follow him and and become the sons and daughters of God through his adoption of us, we can't be running around like little princes and princesses expecting God to bend to our beck and call. We are servants first. And it doesn't uh, depend on our preferences or bend to our will and our whims as to how the kingdom would suit us or not. James, in this passage, he identified the church at its worst. You know, let's face it, he talks about coveting and, and, you know, wanting and those evil desires within us. He talks about fights and quarrels and all of the kinds of things that sadly occupy too much of the church's time. And what he says is that, you know, it points squarely to our pride and our lack of humility. The church is always at its best when we get low and we stop obsessing about our wants and our preferences, when we get over ourselves and get into God, we find that we adopt a much lower posture, but we also find that we get along with others in the kingdom far better because we're not trying to climb over one another to get what we want. We are far more attractive to our world, to our community, when we assume that posture of humility. It's who we need to be to best represent the Lord that we claim we have. You know, we're celebrating communion this morning, and I think there's nothing fitting, uh, more fitting to do than, than in this moment to celebrate communion. You think about it for a moment. So Jesus demonstrated his submission to the will of the Father right from the get-go, right from the very start of his ministry. He submitted to a baptism that he didn't need. And you think about that. How often do we look at at something when it comes to the church and we think, well, I don't need to do that. Regardless of whether it might set a good example if we did do it. You see, when we stop thinking about what we would prefer to, uh, for ourselves and we spend more time dwelling about, about and on the kinds of things that would build up the kingdom, would advance the church, would advance the faith in those around us, when we take that posture, 
God is pleased. It's the posture that Christ assumed at his baptism. And how much more so then that he would assume that position when he embraced the cross and what it would mean for him. In preparation for communion this morning, let's pray and ask, as Paul talked about in Philippians, that this same attitude of humility would be in us as well. Let's pray. Father, Lord, it, it is, um, it's to our regret and our shame that we have to acknowledge that we have been far too proud in the church. We have wanted things our way and we have fought and schemed to try and get that to happen. And Lord, the sad thing is, it can be oftentimes about the most trivial kinds of things. Father, as we look to communion this morning, I pray that we would see again the posture that your son uh, took when it came to advancing the kingdom of God. When he started uh, the kingdom with his baptism, he underwent a baptism that he didn't need for himself personally but he submitted to it to set the right example. In the same way, Lord, what would we say then of the example he set on the cross? Dying for our sins and not for his own. Seeking our forgiveness when he needed none. Bringing us to God by he himself being rejected by God because he took on our sins. Wow. Lord, help us to see in Christ again the example we need to set. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, to disciples that may not have fully understood what he was doing, he took bread. And when he had broke it, he said to them, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And when you do this, when you take this bread and you eat it, and as often as you do this, and by that he was saying, you know, continue to do this with regularity. You know, when we're asked to do something symbolically on a regular basis, it's because the meaning that the symbol represents needs to be ingrained in our psyche, in our attitudes, and our actions stemming from those attitudes need to reflect that we get what the symbol was to show us. So we take bread the symbol of life, the symbol of food, but the symbol of Christ's broken body. We take it and we eat it, remembering what he has done for us. It says in Scripture that in the same way after, after the meal, Jesus took the cup. And in the cup, he demonstrated that it wasn't just the breaking of his body that was going to be um, powerful as a symbol. It would be the shedding of his blood. In God's word, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And when the Son of Man, the Son of God, allowed his precious blood to be spilt on our behalf, he purchased forgiveness for all those who would believe in him, for all those who would take his name upon themselves. 
So as we drink this cup, we are remembering his blood that was shed for us. We're remembering today especially the humility of Christ who would stop at nothing to see, to see fulfilled his mission, his purpose in coming to this world, to die for us and to purchase sons and daughters for the kingdom of God. Let's drink together. Let's remember that as we receive these symbols, they are a reminder to us of what Christ has done for us. But especially this morning, they're a reminder of how we did it. With absolute humility, committed to serving the Father. God bless you this week as you serve the Father in wherever he has you. Amen. My God has-